that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's right you heard it here first here tonight folks this is the word of god from john chapter 3 verse 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life i guess the real question is do you believe on the lord jesus christ here tonight do you know the lord jesus christ here tonight that is a question with eternal consequences young men do you know the lord jesus christ have you repented of your sin and placed your faith and trust in the lord jesus christ there are eternal consequences There are eternal consequences to the answer that you provide. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ here tonight? There's a lot of young people in the world today that do not know the Lord. Are Catholics Christian? Yes. According to whose standard? Oh no, 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 no. There's only one God. You know that? Well, you know that the Pope Francis. You know what the Pope means? It's Antichrist. It's, it's, really it's, it's really not. It's really not. No premarital sex. Well, that's right. That's called fornication. If you were to I do love that. Have a nice night. So it's a very good question here tonight. A lot of people uh, do not understand what it means to be a Christian. In America today, there's a lot of people with differing views of what constitutes being a Christian. As evidenced by these young men here tonight, there are some people that believe that a Christian is a Roman Catholic. But when you read the Word of God, you find out that it's much more than that. You see, Roman Catholicism does not represent the God of the Bible. And that's right. When you think of Roman Catholicism, they have doctrines and beliefs and values that do not line up with the Word of God. And that is unfortunate because many people in the world today Look at Roman Catholics as being Christian. But we know according to the Word of God, the Bible, that there's only one way to be a Christian. Catholicism does not represent Bible-believing, Bible-based Christianity. This is a, another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel, and yet many people in the world today do not understand that distinction. You see, there's only one way to be reconciled to God, and it's not through the Roman Catholic Church. 
There's only one person that's worthy of us confessing our sins to. It is not a Roman Catholic priest. You see, there's only one person that we can go to to receive forgiveness of sin. And that's to the God of all creation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing what happens when we pick up the Bible and read it for ourselves. You see, when you know the history of the Roman Catholic Church, you know that it is a system of unbelief. It is an anti-Christ system that is diametrically opposed to the doctrine of Christ. That is very evident when you understand that the Pope wants to be referred to as Father. And yet uh, Jesus said, Call no man your Father on this earth. For there is one who is your Father, which is in heaven. The Roman Catholic Church also encourages its subjects uh, to confess their sins to the priest, and yet there is no, no basis for that common belief and practice. There's only one to confess your sins to, and that is to the God of all creation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's no penance that you can ever pay to get right with God. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to ever get right with God on your own terms. One of the things we find in America today is that we are typically a very selfish and arrogant people. We're heady and high-minded. We're proud and we think that we know better. We're living in an age of postmodernism that that espouses that there is more than one truth. In fact, in postmodernism, people believe that they are their own, in charge of their own destinies, and that whatever they say is truth. You got your truth, I got my truth, he got his truth, and they have their truth. But that's not what God says in his word. When we read the, God, the word of God, when we understand what the Bible teaches, we find out that there's only one way to be reconciled to God. There's only one way for our sins to be forgiven. There's only one way for us to be in the good graces of God. There's only one way for us to be turned away from being children of wrath to being at peace with God. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. We find in, in God's Word in John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If we look at that one verse in and of itself, that we have a sermon that could go on for days and days and days. There's so much to be spoken of about John 14, 6. In short, one thing that we know that this is Jesus speaking. And as we examine God's Word and read about who Jesus is, the Bible says that Jesus is the Word that was made flesh. That's right, Jesus is the God-man that was made flesh. And there was a reason that Jesus came into the world. He came into the world to save sinners like you and I, like you and me. You see, God in His justice and His mercy and His grace, He could have rightfully not saved anybody at all. In fact, as lawbreakers, we all deserve a criminal's death. We all deserve to suffer for our sin. We all deserve an eternity in hellfire. But God in His mercy and in His grace and in His love, in His justice, He made a way for our sins to be forgiven. He made a way for us to be reconciled to Himself. You see, we don't go to God on our terms. We go to God on His terms. And Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. When we examine who Jesus is, we find out that Jesus is the God-man, Emmanuel, which simply means God with us. And when we understand who Jesus is, we have a greater understanding of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. For Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. When we examine who Jesus is, we see a man that was that came into this world as a God-man, and he lived a sinless life. Now think about that for a minute. How many of you could live a sinless life? Now I would suppose that many of you out there 
don't have a proper understanding of what sin is. There's a many people in America today that have no concept of sin. They have no concept of judgment. They have no concept of being right with God. They do what is right in their own eyes. That is a problem with America. That is a cancer in our culture. This is something that is a terrible blight on a nation that once upheld the word of God, at least to a certain extent. There was a time when people knew what sin is, but we are living in a world and in a culture now that has turned its back away from the God of the Bible. When, when you consider what sin is and recognize that Jesus had no sin, he lived a sinless life while he was on this earth. Think about that for a minute. That is amazing. That is amazing that Jesus lived a sinless life. One of the reasons that he lived a, a sinless life was he, he was always about the will of his Father. As we see Jesus that came into this world, we know that Jesus was always about the will of the Father. He was always about doing what his Father would have him do. And one of the things that we know about Jesus is that he never got distracted. He never got to the point of losing sight of what his mission was at that time. Now think about that. Think about how it is that Jesus could come into this world and do what none of us possibly could ever do. He lived a sinless life. In fact, if Jesus even sinned once, even in word, thought, or deed, he wouldn't have been qualified to be the Lamb of God. You see, there's only one sacrifice that would be acceptable to atone for our sin, and that would be a perfect sacrifice according to the word and will of God. We see according to scripture that John the Baptist recognized Jesus as being the Lamb of God. When we consider the Lamb of God, we understand that the Lamb of God was not allowed to have any sin or any blemish of any kind. When we consider that Jesus is the Lamb of God, we find out that he is the perfect sacrifice that God provided to us all for our sin. You see, this is the love and the grace and, and the mercy of God. When you understand who Jesus is, you understand the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Not only did Jesus come into this world, but he lived a, a perfect life. And Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law that he expected others to follow. Now think about this for a minute. He didn't ask us to do anything that he would not do himself, and he did. He fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled every aspect of the law of God to a T. If he would have even faltered in one aspect of the law, he would have sinned and would not have been able to atone for our sin. Now think about that. This is something that when you consider who Jesus is as the Lamb of God, it's something that you can cry out to Jesus in high praise and, and worship considering the high price that he paid for you and me, that our sins would be forgiven, that we would be reconciled to the God of all creation. You see, when you understand who Jesus is, how is it but that you bend your knee to him in high praise and worship, for he is worthy of our praise. You know, when God created man in the very beginning, he created man in his own image and likeness with the express purpose that we would worship him in spirit and in truth. Unfortunately, something came into the world that detracted us and have affected our relationship with God, and that is sin. Sin is something that came into the world as a result of the first man, Adam, who disobeyed the word of the Lord. As a result of his disobedience, death was brought about upon all mankind. This is a natural death and a spiritual death. We were not created to die. In fact, we were created to live for God. And yet, as a result of sin entering the world, we all die. We all have a very short life as compared to all of eternity. The question really is, in light of the fact that we have such a short life, what are you going to do with eternity? 
What are you going to do with the reality that there's coming a good day that we're all going to stand before God in judgment to give an account for ourselves? When you stand before God, what will you say? What will be your defense? God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That includes you and that includes me. As we've been talking about this Jesus, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now what that simply means is there is only one way to heaven. There's only one way to be reconciled to God. There's only one way for your sins to be forgiven. There's only one way for you to be at peace with God and to know for sure if you were to die in your sin tonight that you would be in the arms of Jesus in the glory of heaven. What's it going to be, folks? This is the call tonight. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have an opportunity to give your life to the Lord, to surrender the reins of your heart to the Lord, the God of all creation. What are you going to do with this? You see, there's only one way to heaven, and you can't earn your way into the good graces of God. You know, there's a lot of rich people in the world today. Just look at Bill Gates himself. He is a multi-billionaire, and yet with all the money that that man has, if he doesn't repent of his sins and place his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will die in his sin and be forever in the torments of the lake of fire. Now think about that. Think about that. You can't buy your way into heaven, though many would try. There's many people that give their money and their goods to the poor, thinking that they are getting a one-up with God. And yet when God looks at this, he sees that this is a dead work. This is a dead work. We know that there's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ, the Lord. That's through Jesus Christ, the only way of salvation. There's also people out there in the world today that think that they are a, that their parents are saved, their mom and dad are saved, their mom and dad know the Lord, and they have the mistaken uh, opinion that because their parents are saved, that they're going to be saved. But let me tell you something, when you stand before God, and give an account of yourself before God, you're not going to be able to say, yeah, but my mama told me, yeah, but my daddy told me, yeah, but my brother told me. No, in fact, folks, when you stand before God, you're going to have nobody else, nowhere else to turn. You're going to have to answer to God for your life and for the choices that you make. The Bible says that every idle word will be held into account before God. Now think about that. That's something that should cause you to fear and tremble that every idle word that we speak will be brought into judgment before God. Now one of the things that we know about the words that we speak is that once we let a word out of our mouth, there is no way for that word to go back into our mouth where it came from in our heart. In fact, once we let the cat out of the bag, there is no way of making it right again. Just like when we do things, we have actions, and we step out, we do bad things, there's no way to undo that. That's just the way it is. In fact, when we consider this, it should cause you to fear and tremble, because one day you will give an account for every word that you speak. You will give an account before God for every action, every sin that you've done in word, thought, or deed, you will give an account to the God of all creation. If that does not cause you to fear and tremble, then take your pulse and make sure the blood is still pumping because that is something that should cause every man, woman, and child to fear and tremble in light of the coming judgment that's coming on this world. You see, there's a lot of people as well. Jesus says, I am the way the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But we know that a lot of people, not only do they think that they'll go to heaven because of their mother and their father, not only do they think that 
think that they're going to get into heaven because they can earn their way into heaven, which is a no-no. But there's a lot of people in the world today that think that they are going to go to heaven because they are perceived to be a good person. The question is, are you a good person? Now, we might disagree on this because there's a lot of people in the world today that have a different view of what constitutes a good and a bad person. But when you talk about the God of all creation, when you talk about his word and his law and what he expects, this gives this good person test a little bit more of a weight. You see, we all have opinions about ourselves, and we all have a tendency to think more of ourselves than what we actually are. But when we examine ourselves in the light of the Word of God, when we examine ourselves in light of the Ten Commandments of God, which are the moral law of God, we find out that we are law breakers. In fact, we have broken the law of God. We all have broken the law in word, thought, and deed. The Bible says in, in the book of James, that if you break even, the transgress in even one area of the law, you are guilty of breaking the whole of the law before God. There is no other way. You see, this is something that should cause you to fear and to tremble. In reality, what is what are we supposed to do when we know that the penalty for our sin is death? What are we supposed to do when we come face to face with the reality of the law of God? This is something that is a message that should cause you to fear and to tremble when considering your true position before the God of all creation. When we examine ourselves according to God's word, when we examine ourselves according to God's law, we find out that we have broken the law of God. And the punishment for being a lawbreaker is death. That's right. You heard that here. That's what the Bible says. The punishment for our sin is death. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we've been talking about, there's a lot of people that don't know that they are sinners. They have no concept of what sin is. They kind of just live their life and, and they're free willing it, and they just throw caution to the wind and live and eat and, and be happy and party hardy with no concept of the coming judgment to come from the God of all creation. When we examine this wrath to come, we, we, see examine, we see examples all throughout Scripture of the wrath of God that's been poured out in the world. We find out when we examine the wrath of God, we see it very clearly in the fact of death entering the world as a result of sin. We also see the wrath of God when we consider the demise of Sodom and Gomorrah. When we examine the, the great flood that came into the world and destroyed the old world, there's only one family, Noah's family, that was saved out of that flood. We see God's wrath being poured out against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. One of the things we know in the world today is that man today is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, thinking that they know better than the God of all creation. But when you come to grips with who God is in the coming judgment, know this, there's nowhere else to turn. There's many people in the world today that think they're going to shake their fist at God and that they're going to be able to run away from the wrath to come. But let me tell you something, there is a day of wrath that's coming, folks. There's a day of wrath where God is going to pour out his wrath upon this world. The only people that are going to be saved are those people that have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only people that are going to be saved are those people that repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. To give you an example of what it means to, to be saved from this wrath to come, just look at the story of Noah and the ark. Everybody that was able to get into the ark were saved from the flood. That is akin to those people who are in Christ Jesus, who are biblically born again, are those people that get into the ark. And those are the people that are able to withstand the storm that's going to be poured out on this world. 
Folks, there's coming a day of judgment. We can put up, we can cover our eyes, and we can cover our ears. We can try to turn a blind eye. We can try to run away from this wrath that's coming. But let me tell you something, there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere, no, no place to go to escape the wrath of God. That's right. So the question is, in light of this coming judgment where God's going to pour out his wrath on this world, and nobody's going to be saved but those people that are in the ark, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. In light of this coming judgment, what are you going to do about it? The Bible says that one day there's going to be a great white throne judgment. And those people whose names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life are going to be cast into the lake of fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now think about that for a minute, folks. This is an eternal judgment. Once you go into this judgment, there is no getting out of it. There's a lot of times in the world today we make mistakes and we try to go back and we try to make things right. But once you draw your last breath and enter into eternity, there's no place to go. There's no way of getting back and trying to right the wrongs that you've done in this life. Oh, where, where at? Where is the window saying? Okay, I didn't know what was going on, sir. We'll turn that up a little bit. Okay, thank you. No, it's down. Yeah, and you know what? If it's still too loud, tell me, and I'll turn down more. You're welcome. We don't want to. We don't want to disturb anybody. So thank you. So there's coming a day of judgment, and there's only one way that you can escape this judgment to come, and that is to cry out to Jesus. There's only one way to escape this judgment, and this is to cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that is able to save you from this judgment to come. Now think about this, folks. There's a lot of times, there's a lot of things in this life that we try to wiggle out of. There's a lot of things in this life that we try to evade and escape and to get away from. But this is one of those things that we cannot get away from. We cannot get away from the wrath to come. The only way, for, the only way of salvation is to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says you must be born again. This is not, this is not an option. If you want to have eternal life, if you want to be reconciled to God, if you want to have your sins forgiven, there's only one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says you must be born again. This is not an option. You see, there is a natural life, and there is a spiritual life. Being born again is a spiritual life brought about by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit of God. One of the issues in life today is that many people want to suppress and hold down this truth and this reality. But when God gets a hold of your heart, look out. If God's tugging on your heart here tonight, if you hear the word of truth, if you believe the gospel, but you're afraid, don't be afraid. Give your life to Jesus. Surrender the reins of your heart to Him tonight. Know that He can do for you what nobody else can do. He can, sin, he can forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and give you everlasting life. Nobody else can do that for you. Nobody else would even do that for you. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now think about that kind of love. As we talked about in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is not optional. That is only one way of salvation. That's only one way into heaven. You see, a lot of people think that all roads lead to heaven. All roads lead to God. Now, I guess in some respects, it's a very interesting concept to think about this aspect of all roads lead to Rome or all roads lead to heaven. Let me tell you something, folks. There are two roads. There's two roads that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. There is a narrow road that leads to life, and few there be that find that road. That is a straight and narrow road. 
that is a road less traveled, that is a non-compromising road, that is a road of peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, that is a road of surrender to the will of God, that is a road that leads to everlasting life. And yet Jesus spoke about another road, and that is the road that leads to death, hell, and destruction. And most people in the world today are on that wide road of destruction. Unfortunately, some people don't even know it. And that's why we're out here tonight. We want to share with you the blessed hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want you to remain on that wide road of destruction if that's the road that you are on tonight. See, that wide road of destruction is the popular road. That is the road where hand join in hand. That is the road where everybody comforts themselves and comforts themselves in their sin. That is the strength in numbers philosophy where people figure that if they can only join up with other people and hold hands with one another that everything is going to work out because there's seemingly strength in numbers. But see, that when, while that might be true with man, that's not true with God, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, Jesus spoke about two roads, the narrow road that leads to life and the wide road that leads to destruction. The question is for you tonight, folks, what road are you on? What road are you on? If you were to draw out your last breath here tonight, and wake up on the other side of eternity like many people do in the world today. There are thousands and thousands of people that die each and every day. If you happen to be one of them, where would you find yourself in eternity? Would you find yourself in the glory of heaven in the arms of Jesus? Or would you find yourself in hell awaiting certain destruction in the lake of fire? That is a sobering thought. That's a sobering thought. Now think about that for a minute. A lot of, to a lot of times we, we live in a culture where if we make a mistake, we try to just go say, well, I'm sorry. And <coughs> we try to uh, let it be done with that. Well, after all, I said, I'm sorry, right? You're supposed to let me off the hook. Well, see, there's some things that you know, we can be sorry about, but there also needs to be something called repentance. One of the things that we know in the culture today Many people like to mouth the words, I'm sorry, and yet not many people in the world today actually want to repent, to go on and to sin no more. You see, a lot of people in the world today have a misconcept, conception of who God is. A lot of people in the world today think that God is a friend of the world, but we know that the Bible says that God hates the hands of 